Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today in this historic church, the Parish Church of Birmingham. I'd like to thank Stuart, the rector of St Martin's, for being a Celtic missionary to Birmingham. Of course, you are following a long line of Celtic missionaries to this city, the greatest of which to the region was, of course, St Chad, the Celt who evangelised the Mercians, and after whom St Chad's Catholic Cathedral is named, and whose remains were in Litchfield for many years and then looked at by the Earl of Shrewsbury. So you're following a long lineage, Stuart. Why do the markets matter? I'd like to answer that question from a historical, a contemporary and a personal point of view, if I may. First of all, historically, let's have a look just behind us here. In this wonderful church, there are two monuments to members of the de Birmingham family. Now, when we were kids at school, those of us who are, went to school in Birmingham, we were taught that Birmingham was named after the de Birminghams. It wasn't. They took their name from Birmingham. They were the lords of the manor de of Birmingham. And it was one of the ancestors of these two de Birminghams here, Peter, who gained the right to have a market charter. Now, why was that important? He gained the right from Henry II in 1166. It was a time of great economic and social change. The population was growing. People were increasingly moving away from an economy based on bartering. I've got half a dozen eggs, you've got half a dozen tomatoes, let's swap them. They were moving away from that bartering economy to a cash economy. And here in the West Midlands, in Birmingham, South Staffordshire, North Warwickshire, North East Worcestershire, there were not many great lords. There was the Lord of Dudley, of course, but most of the lords were small and weren't powerful. And there was an independent-minded peasantry, many of whom were raising stock and not growing crops. That gave them a bit more time. And with that time, they dug iron ore in the black country from the ground, and they cut down the trees of Sutton Park and elsewhere, and they burnt it for charcoal, and they smelted that iron to make the small metal goods that were essential for an agricultural economy. The bits for horses, the nails for horseshoes, the horseshoes, the stirrups, the leather goods. So there's more people, there's a cash economy, and people are making things. As well as growing crops and raising livestock, they're making things. They need somewhere to sell them. Peter of Birmingham, as the lord of the manor, must have been an entrepreneur. His manor was not worth a lot of money. But what he did, he took advantage. He spotted the gap in the market. And before all the other nearby settlements, of Aston in particular, and Yardley, and Arvon, and Kings Norton, and Answorth, he got a market charter. We are here solely because of that reason. It is very rare for historians to be able to pick out one event and one date and say, this started something. We all know the First World War started in 1914, and if I asked a question, most of you would say it was because the Archduke Ferdinand was shot in Sarajevo. That was the spark that set off the war. But of course, the war had been coming for generations, with the rivalry between Britain and France on the one side and Germany. But in this case, we can say Birmingham did begin in 1166. Before that, it was just a, a collection of scattered farms. In 1086, the Doomsday Book said there was 50 people living in, in Birmingham. Of course, that was a much smaller Birmingham today, but that's all there was. Even if we included Yardley, Kings Norton, Erdington, etc., we're looking at a few hundred people. The markets transformed Birmingham. They set Birmingham on the path to becoming the city of a thousand trades. The city in which we once boasted so proudly that you could buy anything you wanted in this street, Edge Baston Street, and every single one of it would be marked Made in Birmingham, from a button to a ship's anchor, from a pin to a brass bedstead. Without the markets, there would never have been the city of a thousand trades. The market traders came in first, and Peter wanted them in because he wanted to charge them a toll, to raise money from that toll. And the descendants of Peter Birmingham and latterly the City Council have made a good living from the tolls charged the traders, the indoor traders and the outdoor traders and the wholesale traders. He laid out Birmingham as a new town to attract these traders in and to attract more people in. Edgebaston Street here was probably the first. We know where he lived. 
It's that horrible car park at the back of us here, Manor House. That's where the Manor House of the Lords of the Manor were until 1819, when Smithfield, the original Smithfield, was put there. He had a moat around it, Moat Road, Moat Lane. We don't know exactly where he put the market. It might have been outside the Manor House, but very quickly he moved it to around here, by St Martins. Why? Because it's at the coming together of a number of important local routes. Stand at the bottom of Camp Hill, and the Coventry Road comes together with the Stratford and Warwick Roads. You come through Derrit End, you cross through the river, the River Ray, and you come into High Birmingham. First of all, Digbeth, then Ball Ring, the Ball Ring, then High Street. And from High Street, Birmingham, you could use to go on to Cozill, or else you could go up, down and Snow Hill on the road to Wolverhampton and West Bromwich. So he put his market where people were passing by. He drew in trade and it was enormously successful. And Birmingham grew rapidly, so rapidly that by the 1400s, it would be probably after Warwick and Coventry, the third biggest town in Warwickshire. And the manufacturers and the traders worked together. There was that intimate bond from the very beginnings. And over time, as Birmingham grew, Trade came in from further afield. Welsh drovers would drive their cattle from Brecon and Radnorshire and Montgomeryshire down to Shrewsbury, across the Severn, down to Wolverhampton and Walsall and to Birmingham to sell off their goods. Just above us, there was a place called the Welsh Cross where the Welsh would sell their cattle. People were coming into Birmingham looking for work, hope and expectations. And it was the market started that whole process off. In the early 19th century, this area around us was a mass of little streets that were so overcrowded that they had to do something about it. There was the shambles where the butchers stood, and there was much more besides. It was tight, it was cramped. And so the forerunners of the council, the street commissioners, did something quite adventurous but important. They knocked down the one side of Spicel Street, Spicel Street runs above us here, they knocked down this side of Spicel Street, and they knocked down the other side of the Bull Ring. The Bull Ring as a street is actually the other side of the road, by Moor Street. And they opened up a great triangle of space that many of you will remember. We sent Martins at its base, with Woolworths just here on the left, am I right, and the steps, with the fish market on the corner of Bell Street, and then that magnificent indoor market, built with its superb Greek-style columns that survived Hitler's blasts in August of 1940. Its roof was gone, and one trader put a Union Jack above his ruined stall, burnt but not bust. And what did the council do? In their dream of creating a Birmingham that was like Chicago, or indeed Moscow, a melding together of influences from Russia and the United States, they deemed those Victorian buildings worthless. They knocked down this magnificent market hall that should have been kept. A market hall that would avoid with Curzon Street Station and that was in the same style of Greco-Roman architecture as our town hall. They knocked it down. And what did they do to the traders in this modern Birmingham? They put them on the wrong side of the new inner ring road. They pushed the working class further out. They'd been trying it for 100 years and now they were going to succeed. They pushed the poor and the working class out of their homes in Ray Street and Skinner Lane where Bernice's dad come out of. They pushed them out of Claybrook Street and Hurst Street, Floodgood Street and Allison Street. And instead of rebuilding locally, they pushed our people out to the edges of the city. And then they thought, well, we don't want the traders anymore. Let's put them on the wrong side. They put Nelson above a urinal. Do you remember by that roundabout? That's where they put poor old Nelson. The first statue of Lord Nelson in England, they put him above a public lavatory. They put the traders underneath an underpass and out here. And then in the late 90s, we thought there was hope that there was going to be another redevelopment of the Bull Ring. And this time, they would recognise the importance of all the traders, indoor, rag, outdoor, wholesale. But what did they do again? They built this great big square not our square. It's on a lease. It's on a lease. It's not owned by us anymore or our council. You try and walk out here now and take a photograph on that square. You'll be stopped. You wouldn't be able to use that camera, Bab, out there because the security guards will come out straight away. We've lost that space. It's not our space anymore. And the traders were moved again across Edgbaston Street. Have a look at the conditions they work in, the stalls that they've got. The traders approached the developers and the council, and I supported them. 
They say we want gaily painted, gaily coloured stalls. We'll do what we need to do to draw people in. They ignored them. And it makes you wonder, is there any political will in this city, amongst all the three major parties, to support the traders? And not just to support the traders, but to support the working class of Birmingham. Because the working class are more and more being pushed out from this city centre. This should be dynamic, bustling and boisterous. If I say to some of the older people in here, do you remember the man in chains? Jimmy Jesus, Holy Joe, the man who swallowed Alcazar blades, the preachers, the singers, the old lady who used to go, oh, glory for me, am I right? Traders like Percy Mosley, the king of the pineapples, who sold the first pineapples in Birmingham. Winnie Hart, the Count. So many names going back generations in Burma's history, names like Bernice's family, the Ellis's, and more besides. We're losing our colour, aren't we? We're losing our character. We're losing our distinctiveness. We're becoming a sanitised, homogenised and pasteurised world in which there is no need for people with character. So historically, for me, the markets are vital. Contemporarily, they're also as vital. There are serious concerns that many of us have about how Birmingham is splitting. There are lots of good things happening in Birmingham, but there are large parts of Birmingham now which are becoming ethnic ghettos. The east of the city, Chardin, Glebe Farm, out to Chelmsley Wood, white working class. Just in that, in, in, inside from there, Washwood Heath, Allen Rock, Spark Hill, Spark Brook, Borsalif, Kashmiri and Punjabi Muslim, Lozells, Bangladeshi, Ladywood, Hockley, African Caribbean. You go out to this market, every single colour, creed and person of Birmingham is gathered there. That's why the markets matter today as well. Because they bring together all of us brummies as traders and as shoppers who can mix with each other, learn from each other and become respectful of each other. Thank you. And finally, personally, why do the markets matter to me? Well, my great-grandmother was a market trader. She was a wardrobe dealer. For those of you who will know that, second-hand clothes dealer. They used to go around mooching around Church Road, Mosley, knocking on the back door because our people weren't allowed to knock on the front doors. And I had a big black bag and I would get some of the cast-off clothes and my granddad Chin in the 1890s and his brothers would come up in their dinner hour with a great big basket carriage on three wheels filled with old clothes and bring them up to their mum. There was no stalls in the rag market then, it was all on the floor. Like Gosta Green, wasn't it? Their market there. And she started to sell clothes. They matter to me personally, not only for my family, because they matter to every Brummie. The market traders are vital for Birmingham's present and its future. If we lose our markets, if we break that umbilical cord, as Bernie said, between the wholesale markets and the outdoor and the indoor, we will lose what we are in here as a people. Irrespective of our class, our colour, our creed, the markets are the beating heart of this city, outside our church, the church that belongs to all of us. I was fortunate to go around with Pete, the wholesale markets, what an asset they should be to Birmingham with our outdoor markets. We should have buskers. We should have bands playing, youngsters singing. We should have it as a place of entertainment like it was in the past, not just selling goods. It's a mixture of things. And so with the wholesale markets, when they close at 11, we should have cafes and bars. And we should make this a major asset. People come to buy their fish, their fruit, their vegetables and their meat from all over the Midlands. Let's value the market traders, and above all, ladies and gentlemen and fellow Brummies, let's value working-class Birmingham.